Well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to have you here today on all three of our Parker Hill campuses for week number four in this series called Storyteller. And uh, during this series, we're talking about some of the stories, some of the parables that Jesus told during his time here on earth. And he told dozens of parables and he used common everyday objects and experiences as a way of helping people to understand some deeper truth about the heart of God. And today we're looking at a parable in Luke chapter 14. It's known as the parable of the great banquet. And uh, as you can tell from the title of this parable, this is a story that revolves around uh, a banquet. It revolves around a dinner party. And that's why there was a fork on your seat as you came in today. Uh, I do hope that you saw the fork before you sat down. Uh, In case you didn't, go ahead and get that right now. And just hang on to that. Set that off to the side. I'll make reference to that a little bit later in the message. Uh, But Luke chapter 14 is where we're going to be today, so I would encourage you, if you have a Bible with you, to open that up on your lap or to open up a Bible on your app, on your phone, or on a tablet, and just follow along along that way, or on the side screens as well. I want to introduce this message by talking about uh, a problem that I see in the church today, uh, a problem as it concerns the way that uh, believers today, Christians today, are perceived. Uh, Let me illustrate it this way. I'm sure most all of you are familiar with Google, that you've used uh, that search engine from time to time. Uh, But one of the more recent things they've added to Google is uh, what they call autofill. And autofill is where you type in a couple of words, and then it will suggest to you a couple of more words to complete a phrase. And these would be the most common phrases that are searched for, like the most popular and most typical phrases that people would do a search on. And it's kind of handy because it will autofill and then you just click on the one that you're looking for. Uh, So I saw saw somebody do this this past week. There's an experiment you can do. If you were to go and if you were to type in the words Jesus is, it will autofill about four different things for you, like Jesus is loving or Jesus is Lord or Jesus is alive or Jesus is coming soon. Those apparently are the most common searches on Google when it comes to Jesus is. But then, if you were to punch in and type in Christians are, there's only one autofill response. Christians are annoying. And I I saw that and I thought to myself, why is there such a difference between the way people see Jesus in our culture and the way that they see the followers of Jesus? I mean, why is that so different? And I've come to the conclusion that it's this. I, I think we have lost sight in many ways, of who Jesus is and why he came and why we needed him to come anyway. In fact, I would narrow it down even further. I I think we've lost sight of one single word. This word is really at the core of of, of our faith as Christians, and that is the word grace. It's a powerful word. It's a beautiful word. It's a word that you hear a lot in church. In fact, we even sang a song a few minutes ago about amazing grace. Uh, So it's a word that you've heard, but I'm not sure it's a word that we always really, truly understand. But let me tell you this, when you begin to really understand what grace is, and when you begin to live your life every single day as a follower of Christ in light of God's grace, when you understand this, when when you begin to live this, It'll change you. It really will. You will become a more grateful, a more humble, a more joyful person. But the opposite of that is true as well. When we begin to lose sight of grace, we become critical and judgmental and downright annoying people. In fact, I came across a quote in the book, What's So Amazing About Grace by Philip Yancey. I love what he wrote here. He said, Mark Twain used to talk about people who were good in the worst sense of the word, a phrase that for many captures the reputation of Christians today. So today we're looking at a parable that's all about grace and why grace is so important. So I want to give you a phrase that summarizes everything that we're going to talk about today and that really summarizes the meaning of this parable in Luke chapter 14. I would say it this way, it's not about my goodness, it's all about his grace. And you say, well, Mark, what do you mean it's not about my goodness? What's it? Well, the message of Christianity, it's not about how good I am. It's all about God's grace. Or, you know, where do I find my identity? Where do I find my security in a relationship with God? I don't find it in in my goodness and how good I am. I find it in, 
in the fact of his never ending grace. And you know, when I tell my story, when I talk about my faith, when I talk about what it means to be a follower of Christ, I shouldn't be talking about my goodness. That's not the point. It's not about how good I am. It's all about his grace. Now, I'm not saying that, that believers, that Christians shouldn't be good people. I think we ought to be very good people. But even the driving force behind our goodness is not our pride. It's still his grace. It's all about his grace. And that's the theme of the parable that Jesus gives here in Luke chapter 14. Let me tell you the context. I want to begin in verse 1 so you can understand the setting for where this parable takes place. It says, one Sabbath, Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent, of a prominent Pharisee. Now, if you've been around church for a while, you know that the Pharisees in Jesus' day, they were the religious leaders. And they were good people. They really, really were good people. They, they tried to live according to the very highest moral standards. They, they had most of the Bible of their day, the Old Testament, memorized. Uh, they were deeply committed to God. They were just very, very, very devout men. But the problem was this, their devotion to God and their religious commitment began to shift to the point where they began having this attitude of superiority. And, and they had a tendency to be proud and self-righteous and to, to kind of look down on everybody else. And so Jesus here, he's sitting at this dinner party in the home of this prominent Pharisee, and he decides that he needs to help them understand that it wasn't just about their goodness. It was about God's grace. And so he tells them a story. Verse 16, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. Now, I love the way the story begins here. See, Jesus, he's trying to help them understand something about the heart of God. He's trying to help them understand something about the kingdom of God. And so he describes the kingdom of God here as a, as a banquet, as a great banquet, as, as a party. And, and, and I love that because, you know, when people think about God and about the kingdom of God and having a relationship with God, I don't think this is what most people think about. Most people think about rules that are rather constricting. They think about, you know, religious rituals. But Jesus here is saying that the kingdom of God, it's, it's kind of like a, a great banquet. It's like a party. I mean, after all, do you know that the very first miracle that Jesus performed, he performed at a wedding reception where he made 180 gallons of the finest wine that people had ever tasted? I, I think he was kind of into parties. And, and this is the theme of, of God's kingdom. In fact, you see this in different places throughout the Bible. If you go very, to the very end of the Bible in Revelation chapter 19, uh, you read this in verse 7. It says, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. And this is looking ahead in time. It's looking ahead to the day when history has ended and all of God's redeemed people have gathered together for what is described here as a wedding banquet. It says, for the wedding of the Lamb... And in the book of Revelation, uh, the title Lamb is just a different name for Jesus. Uh, the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride, and the bride is always, in the Bible, it's the church. That's you and me, if you're a believer. Uh, his bride has made herself ready. And then in verse 9, it goes on to say this. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who, invite, who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And so someday in eternity, what we will do is we will sit down to a great banquet. We've got a party waiting for us. And even 700 years before Jesus came on the scene, Isaiah, one of the Jewish prophets, he said this, he said, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples. This is what's gonna happen someday. This is what we look forward to, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. And so when you think about the kingdom of God, when you think about eternity, when you think about heaven, it, just think about something like this. I mean, that makes your mouth water, doesn't it? In fact, I've been on this kind of uh, diet. I have not had any red meat for like two weeks. And so that is killing me. Just get that off the screen right now if you don't mind doing that. That's the kingdom. That's what we have to look forward. And so being a Christ follower means that you have a seat waiting for you at the banquet table, that you are on your way to a party, which means this. We ought to live all of our lives with a sense of joy and with a sense of anticipation. In fact, every time we get together as a church here at Parker Hill, we believe that our worship ought to be a time of celebration. 
We, ought to, we believe it ought to feel like a, a, a little party that just kind of precedes the big party that's going to happen someday. And, and every once in a while, somebody will say to me, they'll say, you know, Mark, when I come to church, I really want to come to church to, to contemplate. We don't do that here. So you can contemplate at home. When we come together, we celebrate because the tomb is empty and I've been forgiven and I've got a place waiting for me at the banquet table. And so when we get together, we are going to celebrate. So that's kind of a rabbit trail. Back to the parable. There's this banquet. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. Now, let let me explain the the cultural traditions here because this might be a little bit confusing if you're not familiar with the culture of that day. Uh, In those days, if you wanted to give a banquet, if you wanted to throw a party, there were actually two invitations that had to go out. Uh, The the first thing you had to do was to send out an invitation uh, to find out how many people would actually want to come. And so this was in the days before Facebook, so you had to actually send your servant out and he would go to all your friends and he would say, hey, my master is having a banquet in about three weeks or so. Would you be interested in coming? And then the servant would come back with all the RSVPs. And so you know how many people you had. And then, then you would begin preparing. You would begin to harvest the food and make the bread and you would begin to slaughter you know, the livestock and you would get everything ready for this banquet that was coming. Now, people in the first century, they didn't live by clocks and calendars the way that we do today. And so when the feast was ready, you know, they'd send out that first invitation and they say, you know, it's going to be approximately, you know, about three weeks. But then when everything was just about ready, there was that second invitation. The servant would go back out again to all the guests who had said yes, and he would say, the banquet is ready. You may now come. Okay. And so that's the part we're at in the story. But something really, really strange happens at this point in the story because the banquet is ready, the table is set, everything's been prepared, but then some of the guests that RSVP'd, they decide at the last minute they're not going to come. Look at verse 18. But they all alike began to make excuses. Now, To accept an invitation and then not show up, I mean, that would be bad manners in our culture. But in that culture, that was unthinkable. I mean, that was perceived as a deep insult to the person who had prepared the banquet for you. And then to make matters worse, the people who decide not to show up, the excuses they give, they're like really lame excuses. Listen to this. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Now, you got to understand that that is a really odd excuse because in that culture where you made your living off your land, you would never buy a piece of property without first inspecting it very thoroughly and very carefully. I mean, this would be like me saying, hey, I'd love to come to dinner, but I can't. I just bought a house and I have to go see it to find out what neighborhood it's in and what kind of condition it's in. I mean, obviously, it's just a a made-up excuse. Then the second one is this in verse 19. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. You know, again, in that culture, five yoke of oxen, that was a huge investment. And you would never buy something like that sight unseen. You would go and look at the oxen. You would make sure they were healthy. You, You would make sure that the teams worked well together. You wouldn't just go out and buy them and then later on try to take a look at them. And then the third excuse, this one here, still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Eh, That one might be legit, I don't know. Now, this, this is like, okay, okay, sure, that makes a lot of sense. Like your wife, your new bride, doesn't want to come to a party with fancy food and get all dressed up and eat a meal that she doesn't have to prepare and doesn't have to clean up after. Okay, I get it. She wants to stay home and watch ESPN with you and eat Doritos. I mean, that makes no sense at all. The point is this, that even these excuses are not legitimate. So not even do these guests cancel, but then they add insult to injury by just giving all these crazy, crazy excuses. Uh, Let me me paint a picture for you. Imagine it this way. Imagine that uh, one day this week, you receive an invitation from the President of the United States, the most powerful person in the world. And it's an invitation written specifically to you 
personally written. And it says, hey, I'm having a party. It's going to be a great party. Everything is provided for you. I just want you to come and enjoy what I have prepared for you at this big party. And on such and such a day, we're going to come and pick you up in a limousine, and we'll bring you to the party, and you will have the chance to enjoy the finest food and the best entertainment that your tax money can buy. And so you get the invitation, and you respond to it, and you say, sure, I'll be there, because who wouldn't want to do that? But then the day of the party rolls around and a limo pulls up in front of your house and the secret service guy gets out, he knocks on your door, you open the door and you've got a t-shirt and cut off shorts on. You say, oh yeah, I was gonna call you about that whole party thing. I mean, I just got a new flat screen TV and I just really wanted to try it out today. So like, sorry, I, I, I can't come. Like that would be crazy. I mean, even if you didn't vote for the president, even, even if you don't like the president, you're still going to go to a party at the White House. I mean, who wouldn't? And who would ever give such a silly, silly excuse? And that's kind of what's happening here in this, in this story that Jesus is telling in this picture that he's painting. So verse 21, here's what it says. The servant came back and reported this to his master. And it's like they're not coming, and they got the strangest excuses. Then the owner of the house became angry. And he was angry with good cause because behavior like that in that society was not just impolite. It showed great disrespect to the one who had gone to all the trouble and all the expense of preparing the banquet. But see, now this guy's in a predicament because he's put all this time and all this money into preparing this meal, but now the guests aren't showing up and there's no refrigeration. So all this food is going to go to waste. So here's what happens. Go back to verse 21 again. Then the owner of the house became angry, and he ordered his servant, go out quickly, because the food's all ready. It's still warm. Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And so this servant, he goes out into the back alleys, he goes out into the gutters, and he finds the outcasts of culture. He finds the people that are beggars and the people that nobody wants to talk to. He finds the people that would never be invited to a banquet, and he invites them to a banquet. It's just a cool story. But then he comes back, verse 22. It says, he says, sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. He says, listen, I want you to go outside the city walls. You go out into the country. You go from farm to farm. You invite every farmer. You invite every peasant. You invite every stranger because I want my house to be full. I went to all this trouble. I paid all this money. I had all this expense. And, and it says here, I want you to compel them to come in. Let, let me explain that to you. It doesn't mean that, you know, you forcibly make them come against their will. See, the master knew something. And the way Jesus tells this story is so, so, so um, accurate in the culture of that day. In that day, if you were to receive an invitation from somebody who was in a higher social class than you, it was almost automatic that you would decline it. And the master knows this is going to happen. They're going to say, well, wait a minute. He's rich and, and I'm poor and, and he's great and I'm a nobody and I, I wouldn't fit in there. I wouldn't belong in, in that kind of a banquet. And he can't really be serious about this invitation. I mean, I appreciate him thinking of me, but I think he's just being polite and so I could never say yes. I mean, it feels nice to be asked, but I can't come. And so the master says, listen, don't take no for an answer. When you get out there and they politely decline you because they think that's the right thing to do, you just ask them again, and then you ask them again, and then you ask them again because I want my house to be full. Now, when you read a parable like this, when you hear a story like this, you, you can't just read it. You gotta feel it. You've gotta put yourself in the story. And I want you to do that. Now, I, I want you to imagine that, that you are one of these uh, crippled and lame and blind. You were one of these strangers that had never met the guy. You're one of these beggars who suddenly find themselves invited to a banquet, and you were suddenly sitting in a chair that you never thought you'd ever get to sit in in your life, and you, you're eating food that you never thought you would ever get to taste. I mean, can you imagine that? Can I tell you something? I think that would be a fun banquet. 
wouldn't it? This wouldn't be one of those, you know, stuffy, formal events with tables full of well-dressed, uptight people. This would be a fun banquet because, listen, nobody appreciates a banquet more than a beggar. And I love this story. And I was thinking about this story when there was a news story that caught my attention uh, about a year ago. This, this was an interview with a, with a couple by the name of Willie and Carol Fowler. And, and this is them in the picture. And uh, their daughter... Their daughter was getting married, and, and she was their only child, and so they wanted to spare no expense for her wedding, and so they did that. But then about a month before her wedding, uh, the groom decided he didn't want to get married, and so they had to cancel the wedding. The problem was that they had already booked the reception, so all the food and the venue and the band and all the entertainment had been paid for. It was way too late to get a refund. So do you know what they did? They decided to go ahead with the reception. They decided to go ahead and throw the banquet anyway, but they just changed the guest list a little bit. They invited 200 homeless people from around the city of Atlanta. So on the day when the wedding was supposed to have happened, on the day of this big, big banquet, they sent out five buses to homeless shelters all over Atlanta, and they brought all those folks back to the reception hall, and they got a break for one day from life out on the streets, and they had a four-course meal. They had the choice of chicken or salmon, and they drank champagne, and they ate wedding cake, and they danced late into the night. And I thought, man, that is just such a picture of the gospel. That is such a picture of this parable that all of us who are broken and poor and powerless people, we've been invited to a banquet we get to come to a banquet that we didn't deserve and we didn't pay for. I mean, that's an incredible, incredible story that Jesus tells. But what does it mean? I mean, what is the meaning behind this, this parable? What's the meaning behind this story? Well, I think it, it had a meaning for those who were sitting in the room that day, especially the religious leaders, the Pharisees. Uh, this was a message for them because when Jesus came on the scene, he, he gave an invitation. I mean, God the Father had been giving an initial invitation through the Jewish prophets and through all the symbolism of their worship for many, many years. But then Jesus shows up and he says, listen, the party's here. The banquet is about to begin. Follow me. And the ones who should have responded to that invitation most quickly were the religious leaders, but they didn't. They were too proud. They were too stubborn. And so they just started making up all kinds of excuses. And so the ones who accepted the invitation were the fishermen and the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the lepers. And so Jesus is telling these religious leaders, listen, you shouldn't complain about the people that I hang out with because they're the ones who were willing to accept the invitation. So it, it, it had that meaning, but it also has meaning for us today because as I said earlier, this parable is a parable that's all about grace. It's a story about grace. And when it comes to grace, I think there are three things that all of us need to do. Number one, we need to receive God's grace. See, you've been given an invitation. An invitation was given to you almost 2,000 years ago on a Roman cross just outside the city of Jerusalem. You know, the cross was not given to us so that we'd have a decoration for church buildings. It was not given to us so that you would have a piece of jewelry to wear. The cross is not intended to be a decoration. The cross is an invitation. It's an invitation that says your sins can be forgiven. The price has been paid. There is a seat ready and waiting for you at the banquet. I love what it says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. This is Jesus speaking. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with that person. We're going to sit down to a banquet. We're going to have a party and they with me. There's an invitation out there waiting for you. And just like some of the people in the story that Jesus told ignored the invitation, some of you have been ignoring that invitation. You may listen online every single week. You may have been one of our atten attending one of our campuses for a while, and, and, and you know, you're, you're hearing this truth, and, and you haven't responded to it. Maybe it's because your life is going pretty smooth right now. You know, your life is pretty wrinkle-free, and so you don't think you really need God. 
Or maybe you're just very busy and, you know, you're so busy you don't think you have time for any serious spiritual reflection. Or maybe for you, you're a little bit afraid. You're afraid of what the implications might be if you were to truly give your heart and your life to following Jesus Christ. I don't know what your excuses are, but lots of people have excuses for not responding to the greatest invitation in history. But I think the number one reason why people ignore this invitation, if I can be honest with you, It's pride. It really is. There is just something within our hearts that resists the idea that we are sinners who need a Savior, that we need someone else to provide for us a place at the banquet table. We don't like the idea that we're the outcast, we're the struggler, we're the stranger. In fact, about about 10 years ago, Ted Turner was being interviewed in the Dallas Morning News. Ted Turner is a billionaire. He's the founder of CNN. And he said this, he said, Christianity is a religion for losers. I don't need anybody to die for me. Now, he said it out loud, but I think lots of people think that. Because listen, it's humbling to think that our sin would necessitate the kind of pain and the kind of suffering that took place on that cross. And so we we say, you know what, I'm a pretty good person, I really am. I'm above average. I'm really a moral person, I don't. I don't need a savior. I don't need to respond to that invitation. But li- listen to some very sobering words here in Isaiah chapter 64. It says, all of us have become like one who is unclean. It's all of us. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Notice it doesn't say that our unrighteous acts are like filthy rags. It's very interesting. It says the best we have to offer, our best efforts in the eyes of God, kind of like filthy rags. Let me illustrate that for you. When I was a kid, uh, there were times when we would be leaving our house and there would be something out of place with one of us. And so my, my mom would do this very strange thing. You know, if one of us had some dirt on our face or there was some hair sticking up, you know, she would kind of spit in her hand and she would, you know, wipe off the dirt or she would put the hair back in place. And we call that mama spit. Uh, mama spit was one of the most common cleaners in our household, and some of you guys use it too because we see you walking uh, into church and using the mama spit. Uh, Can I tell you something? Our righteous acts, that's kind of like mama spit. You know, you you think you're cleaning yourself up, but it it really just doesn't work that way. It's just pride. And I, I don't know what it is that's keeping you from accepting this invitation that's been so freely offered to you. Maybe it is pride. Maybe it's your busyness, maybe it's your schedule, maybe it's your money, I don't know. But let me tell you today, you have got to put all of those things aside because the weightiness of this invitation makes any excuse seem ridiculous. It really does. The weightiness of this invitation to forgiveness and eternal life makes any excuse you can come up with seem silly. And I would encourage you maybe today to simply pray a prayer of receiving and accepting that invitation and and maybe even in this service in the quietness of your seat, you just stop and you pray something like this and you say, Lord, I recognize I'm a sinner. I recognize that I'm someone in need of forgiveness, in need of your grace. Thank you for paying the price for me, for creating a place for me at your banquet table that I never could have created for myself. And today I invite Jesus to be my Savior and the forgiver of my sins. And today I commit myself to following him with with my life. And, And maybe today you just need to stop and you just need to receive grace and pray a prayer like that in the quietness of your own heart and the quietness of your own seed. I mean, that's the very first step. But then the second thing we need to do after we receive grace is we need to constantly remember God's grace. We need to constantly remember that spiritually speaking, all of us are the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame in this story. None of us were on the A list. None of us deserved to be at the table. We get to go to the banquet. We get a place at the table because someone else left his place and went to a cross for us. And you know, I I constantly need to remember God's grace because I know the truth about myself. I know the truth of who I really am and what I think and what temptations I face. And I'm amazed that there is a God in heaven who is perfect, who would love me and shower his grace upon me and forgive me. And I, I hope, 
I hope I never take that for granted. I hope that never gets old. I hope that you never forget that. In fact, that little fork that you had with you on your seat there, maybe when you take that home today, that can be just a reminder to you of God's grace, that you have been given a place at his table, a place that you did not earn and you did not deserve. Because here's what I've learned about grace. At first, grace is amazing, just like we sung a little while ago in this service. It's amazing grace when we first figure it out and we first embrace it. But over time, that begins to fade, and eventually, a couple of years later, it becomes intriguing grace, and then eventually, it becomes interesting grace, and pretty soon, it's just grace. And listen, my friend, I I don't care how long it's been since you cried out for grace. I hope it's still amazing to you, and I hope it always will be. We need to remember God's grace, because whenever you meet Christians who are joyless and judgmental, and critical, I can tell you why it is they failed to remember God's grace because God's grace, when you understand it and when you live in light of it, it will change you. We've got to receive it. We've always got to remember it. And third, we've got to do this. We've got to declare God's grace. And during this week, as I've been kind of wrestling with this passage and with this parable, there's one phrase in it that just has kept coming back up in my mind over and over again. It's kind of haunted me here in verse 23, where the master says this, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in. Compel them so that my house will be full. There was a sense of urgency here. And I think we need to feel that same sense of urgency. So here's a question. Who are the people that God wants you to invite to his banquet? Who are the people that God wants to have at his table? Someone that is within your sphere of influence. I mean, maybe when when you take that fork home, you can just put that somewhere where you're going to see it on a regular basis and let that be a reminder to you that there is someone in your life that God wants you to reach out to to because there's someone in your life that God wants to see at his banquet table. And I don't know who that may be in your life. It may be a neighbor, somebody who lives on your cul-de-sac or just down the street. The truth is they may never darken the door of a church. And the only time they're going to see the Savior, the only time they're going to see Jesus is when they see it, when they see him in you and the way that you live and the way that you uh, talk. Maybe for you it's a coworker, it's somebody in that cubicle next to you. And maybe God strategically placed you in that office environment or that factory environment or whatever it be so that you could so that you could reach out to that person maybe for you it's someone in the community maybe maybe the reason why your kid is on the t-ball team is not so that he will become a professional baseball player because he won't i'm just going to tell you that right up front maybe the reason you're there is to build a relationship with another mom or another dad who just needs to understand god's heart for them i don't know who that is in your life but who are the people in your life that God might want you to invite to his banquet? And again, put yourself in this story. Imagine being this servant who gets to go out and declare the news to one of those beggars, to one of those outcasts, and saying, you're not going to believe this, but there's a party waiting for you. And to be able to see the joy in their eyes and to be able to see them sit down at that table. I mean, there is nothing like bringing another human being to the table, to the table of life and joy and eternity. So when it comes to grace, we got to receive it, we remember it, and then we got to declare it. Today, we're going to end our service by uh, celebrating communion together. And uh, communion is is an act of worship that goes back almost 2,000 years. Uh, Jesus, on the night that he was crucified just a few hours before he was betrayed and went to that cross. Do you know what he did? He sat down and he enjoyed one last meal with his closest followers, his disciples. And they shared together in what was called the Jewish Passover meal. But Jesus, during that meal, he took two of the main elements, wine and bread. And as he held them up, he kind of infused them with a brand new meaning. And so on every campus, there are four tables in the room. There are two at the front and two at the back. And on those tables are pieces of bread and cups of juice. And those are elements that connect us back centuries to that night in that upper room when Jesus shared that meal with his first followers. That bread is a symbol. It represents the body of Christ, that the body of that baby that was laid in a manger in Bethlehem, the body of that man that climbed the hill carrying his own cross at least for a while, that body that was wrapped and laid in a tomb, that bread represents his body. It's a powerful connection 
to him. And then the, the cup, the juice, that represents his blood, that blood that stained the timbers of that Roman cross. And on the night when they gathered together as they shared that meal and as Jesus gave new meaning to these symbols, he said something that I think is absolutely fascinating. In Matthew chapter 26, he said, this cup, speaking of the cup of wine that they would share, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then he goes on to say this, and I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. In other words, he's saying, as you drink of this cup, let it remind you that there is coming a day when we will eat together again and drink together again in a place that is perfect in the greatest banquet that there has ever been. So today, we're going to remember that And if you're seated toward the front half of the room, you can take advantage of the tables in the front. Back half of the room, you can go to the tables in the back. And uh, here's what's going to happen. In in just a few minutes, the ushers are going to come and dismiss you a row at a time by the outside aisles. And you can come by the table, take the bread, dip it in the juice, and eat it. And then make your way back to, to your seat by the inside aisle. And if you're a follower of Christ, you're welcome to participate, to celebrate with us today. If you're not yet a believer... Uh, and you just want to sit back and observe, that's okay if you're not, or if you're not prepared today to participate, you can sit back and observe. And we're going to see a video in just a a moment, and that's just an opportunity for us just to stop and reflect on what we've heard and experienced today in this parable, and maybe just spend a moment in prayer. And then the band is going to come back up, and they're going to begin a song, and the ushers will dismiss you, and during that song, just come to the table and stop, and with those symbols, remember, look back, to a cross where the price was paid, and then look ahead to that day when we will sit down together at a banquet.